You're listening to Depth Perception, supported by our patrons on Patreon. Hey everybody, Leo here. This is one episode of two dealing with the phrase alt-left woke culture. This is a phrase that we pulled from a uh, thread in Out of the Loop subreddit, not because we think it's a thing, but because we wanted to deconstruct it. So that's the framing device for the next two episodes. That's what we're trying to talk about. In this episode, you're going to hear us talk about why we think the idea of the alt-left exists and what goals it serves um, for people on the right in particular, and also actually in the center as well. Next week, we're going to be talking about woke culture. We make the mistake of trying to talk about cancel culture, woke culture, and PC culture simply because these things are associated, not because we think they're the same. If you like a lively, albeit unfocused discussion, I hope you'll tune in next week for part two. Also in order is a trigger warning for discussions of Nazism, state violence, genocide. We're going to be talking about fascists for a large part of the program today. And tangentially, and much less seriously, spoiler alert for Jojo Rabbit. When you hear Randy mention it, just skip about a minute ahead and you'll miss that discussion. Here's Alt-Left Woke Culture Part 1. I'm Leo. I'm Randy. And we're here to talk about, well, we were going to talk about 2 plus 2 equals 5 in alt-left woke culture. It's an old uh, Twitter controversy at this point where a guy named Kareem Carr um, made a, a, a tried to, was trying to talk about sort of what the consequences of using numbers to represent, like, not purely mathematical things in the real world, like IQ, and... Uh, it turned into this like Twitter row about people being like two plus two just equals four, and his point was like, well, if you assign a number to some to some thing in the world, and then you do things like mathematical operations on the abstraction, the number, not that you know, um, you might come up with results that don't make sense, uh, or that make sense in the math, but they don't actually reflect the real world. And he was giving sort of the opposite of that, which is something that doesn't make sense in the math, but that does reflect the real world. For instance, a chicken plus a chicken equaling another chicken. One chicken, two chickens. Um, well, it was the... one, pl- one chicken one, yeah. plus so, one yeah, chicken yeah, yeah. equals right. three chickens. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Right. One chicken plus one chicken equaling three chickens. So that was the, uh, that was, that was the gist of it. And, uh, and I, I think that... I think that's the, the 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 connection to alt left woke culture originally came in from somebody uh, criticizing it from like like trying to make a point about the left or like liberals or something saying you know like this is like pe- people people can't deal with the fact that two plus two just equals four all the time you know like it, it became a surrogate for um, what people I think who consider themselves often to be centrists or liberals uh, and people like fascists who saw an opportunity to make a big thing about how this is the alt left or whatever this is. Um, and so we, I wanted, my idea was to, to talk about uh, sort of the various elements of this, maybe as separate episodes, maybe that run a little bit shorter than the first two episodes we've done. Um, and the lost episode, which yeah, we'll, we'll redo that later. sometime. Yeah, so, uh, and, and I wanted to start by talking about the idea of the alt-left and examining whether this idea even holds water, what the implication of it is, uh, what the implications of it are... Uh, like in the shadow Since the of rise the of the alt-right. In the shadow of the rise of the alt-right. And, and who's using that terminology? Who's pushing it out into the world and what their agenda is? That's our podcast today. One thing I want to mention was that in that thread, I thought the point was really well illustrated. Um, first by the use of the chickens as an example, and then by the use of the oranges. Right, because you you put the two chickens together, you can get a you can get the third chicken. You put two oranges together, you're always going to have two oranges. They're not going to reproduce. And I, I, I'm curious how it became less about 
math being abstract and more about the alt-right and people like Jordan Peterson and Joe Rogan you know you using it as a way to say that the um the people on the left have uh have begun trying to orchestrate like an orwellian world state right i i don't i i i don't know how it gets there because it i i mean it had to have started with one person there's Right. The reason, yes. Well, no. I maybe. Um, I think it started with people saying, like, "How are we going to make it okay to be a fascist in public?" Uh, you know, or more okay than it was. People. This has to do with strategically planning how to make fascism look legitimate. The term alt right is, you know, it's a it's an intentional rebrand of fasci ideology that sounds like it's part of a broader. Uh, right right wing movement and then becomes a broader right wing movement and everyone you know all of a sudden like fascism is a broader right wing movement uh when, when you ha- i think the what's behind this idea is actually um a very simple like a very important in, but, but simple motivation for people on the right and that is if you can say the the idea the, that is what what do you get from spreading the idea that um like the left is trying to orchestrate like a like a totalitarian nightmare. A couple things. One of them, you take the focus off of fascists who want that. Um, you take the fo- you take the focus off of um, what the people are actually saying, also, and and the idea that it has legitimacy. But I think the most important element of this is. Um, that you're get, you're just repeating this the narrative that that um, the idea that there's some there's such a thing as being too progressive the idea that the, the idea that accepting and discussing abstract ideas can lead to totalitarianism um, serves the narrative that the left in general is going to lead us to totalitarianism it's like a, one example. It's a it's a chance for people on the right to repeat this idea, and if you repeat it enough, people are going to believe it, and that's really what the danger is. It's not really even about the specific issue. It's just that it's just that it's another opportunity to drag people into a debate that they can't win. Yeah, it's it's this thing that you always hear that is attached to fascism, which is, you know, when when you are a fascist and you're trying to grab on to whatever whatever it is like power or attention or anything you know you have to you have to define an enemy and or an adversary and they have to be simultaneously like too weak to take you down and too strong to stand up against right the reality is that fascism only requires passivity from from the masses it's all it requires it is like to me it is like the natural order of things if if nobody ever did anything we would wind up with fa- like a fascist state but to achieve the goals of leftists and by leftists i mean people on the left i don't mean the centrists that call themselves liberals and everything to do that requires actual work. I mean, that requires a mass movement. Yeah. I and mean, it also requires action before we have necessarily got all of our goals figured out, um, which is a complicated thing. And it's a thing. And it, that doesn't mean, like, pe- you shouldn't just accept what any leftist does that, you know, um, as. Exactly, because it, without criticism. There's people, there's people that are just as dangerous. I, I, would, I would just argue that, like, whether or not they're the same amount of dangerous you know, they don't have the same capabilities. You know, there's not the same potential to be dangerous, whether or not they could be just as dangerous. I mean, people always like to call Nazism left-wing. Which is, of course, a historically inaccurate It's not. not e- like, you know, the USSR wasn't a left-wing government. Well, it depends on who you talk to. There's well, of course it does. That, yeah. 
but fascism I, itself is is far right ideology. Yeah, yeah, but you know the USSR isn't isn't fash. It's it's a totalitarian left government that I don't think turned out well, but started out left. Well, you know, started. I mean, did it of, like did it though? Like, what? How left was it? it? To to me, it's it's not it's not about. To me, it's not about the enthusiasm of the worker or the happiness of all mankind. Mm-hmm. Like that was not the mm-hmm. goal. You know, the goal was to control the state. Yeah, but we need to make a distinction between fascism and and, and totalitarian left okay, governments. Okay, so make it. It, it. A lot of the time, it comes down to just who is the is the government for. So the reason that the Soviet Union is still left is because the goals and the methods are aimed at greater social equality, and the long-term goal of the Soviet Union is communism. If you read the writings of Lenin early on in the Soviet Union, and also before the Soviet Union, he never claimed that the Soviet Union had become communist. Soviet Un- so communism is communism to Lenin and to many Marxists is a state in the future where there truly are no classes, there truly is no money, People work according to their according to their abilities. Everybody gets what they need according to their needs. Basically, it's a way to sort of reorganize the entirety of human society into a stable state that no longer um, requires or encourages classes and inequality. It's ultimate democracy, ultimate community living without a- any um, oppressive social constraints. It's basically what anarchists want, but the difference is that people like the Bolsheviks wanted to get there by they had a process in mind they had what and that they considered to be scientific that you need to go through socialism meaning some kind of system that involves government centralization and distribution of resources and distribution of um, for example things like scrip uh, s- currencies that that uh, temporarily will be used because you have to wean yourself off of sort of all of the high the products of social hierarchy that have that have existed for a long time in order to get towards uh, real communism so, so people will refer to, so yeah, are you ahead. are you saying that a group like the Bolsheviks are uh, are treating totalitarian totalitarian leftist politic as a path to communism well, they're treating a centralized state. Yeah, I mean, I would, I, I think that it's not inaccurate to call somebody like Stalin a totalitarian leader because of the culture that developed around him in the Soviet Union. But I think it's also important to remember that he wasn't one man trying to operate, like, try, like, who, he wasn't, it wasn't like he was one guy within a state trying to be like, um, I'm going to take over and, and do, like, there, there were so many external factors that led to Stalin being the one. There was so much outside active sabotage of the Soviet Union by all of the bourgeois states that existed in the world that had a very deep vested interest in not allowing communism to prevail. For example, like how many wars were fought against communism during the Cold War. The reason the Cold War existed was because the largest threat to the way of life of the people in power um, in the rest of the world, in, you know, in the West, was communism was the fact that, that maybe the Soviet, the Soviet Union still existed and maybe it could improve enough to, to become what it wanted to be. Well, yeah, I, I don't want I, I to say that like, it started bad and that it became bad because the people that were doing it were entirely bad. I mean, I think, I think it's... I think American intervention has a lot to do with things going wrong you know, in the Eastern Bloc, um, be it, you know, whether whether it's, like, constantly threatening them with nuclear devastation or, or anything, uh, so many of the other things that we've done. I mean, how, how badly did we hamper progress by sanctioning, like, goods yeah. and resources and yeah. everything? Yeah. And also just by um, leading them into, like, into conflicts and, like, things like the arms race, like, getting them in a position where sociopolitically they had to waste resources on things that were not essential to... Like, I think the space helpful. race was a good thing. I think the space race, like, should have been a good thing. In what way? 
I mean, I think it should have been a positive thing for the world. Like, if it was like a friendly competition, right? Instead of in reality, it was two it was two yeah. two governments racing to find how to use space as a weapon. Right. Well, it was the United States. I think that there's a strong case for it was the United States saying, if the Soviet Union knows that we're going like that they, that there's a possibility of us like being able to use space to destroy them they'll have to waste a bunch of resources on developing some more technology. Yeah, I I I don't think I don't think for the government it was about figuring out what we can do with space positively. You know, it, it wasn't about that. I mean, maybe the scientists were thinking about that. I don't think I don't think Operation Paperclip led to a bunch of really generous world-saving scientists. Oh yeah, we used a bunch of we used a bunch of old fascists in order to um yeah, the most awful Nazi scientists yeah. were picked up by the U.S. and the Soviet Union. Right, we used people who were on, on, on the payroll with, with fucking Joseph Mengele. He's just some of the worst people in the world, um, and, and, and many of whom I'm sure harbored fascist beliefs themselves, probably the majority of which. Yeah, they, you, yeah. I, think, I think most of the time you can find a way to not do bad things. Yeah. <laughs> even, when um, you're, even when you're under the gun, like... I mean, I have no doubt that they were forced to do a lot of the things they did, but you can, in some cases, like, you can be forced and also consent without being under duress, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, right, it's not so much about the individual people, it's about the fact that the United States consciously was like, we're going to scoop up Nazi scientists and use them specifically for the rocket to technology to, like, to, to, we're going to weaponize nazis against yeah against communism so and the nazis that they got <laughs> yeah i don't know about that did they also get i nazis? mean they must have we didn't get them all <laughs> uh yeah i don't know I mean, we um, definitely didn't get them all or they wouldn't be around now um yeah, but just to distinguish it from to, uh, the Soviet Union from fascism, uh, fascism is a you know it it doesn't have the the goal of of a communist utopia. It has the goal of of it, it like it has the goal of like eliminating an enemy, uh, and the utopia is kept more. Um, I think is is very much secondary, not necessarily to the people who are. But like you said, it has more to do with. A society of people being passive and being like, well, things aren't getting worse for me. Morale is up. You know, um, we have something to believe in. A and not really, but whereas communism requires the building of vast coalitions of people who, who like, you have to find some way to talk to them. You have to, like, together educate yourselves towards thinking not only, like, this, that, like, a, a better life is possible, but, like, Thinking like thinking about the strategies that it takes to get toward it. It's it's um, super convenient for me that I watched Jojo Rabbit today. The uh, for those who don't know, it's about a boy who has uh, an imaginary Hitler friend who's growing up in Nazi Germany. Unless he is Hitler, I don't think he is Hitler. I think, I mean, he is he is Hitler, but he's imaginary Hitler. But there is a real Hitler at the time. Um, and all he wants to do is be a Nazi, but the, I, I don't remember her name, but the Jewish girl that his mother hides in the annex, it's like, you're not a Nazi, you just want to be part of the club, and, you know, you want to have people that can listen to you, and you want to be in a position of authority, and all this, and I think that's, I think that lead is so much of, of what lets people fall in line with, uh, with fascism, is, is wanting to have even even if you don't do anything, like, if you end up in a position of power, even by doing nothing, like, a lot of the time you're going to do it. I mean, you get promotions at work sometimes not for doing, for just being a jack-off. Like, you don't have to do anything good and you can get a promotion at work. And it's it's the same thing, like, you, if you, if you are offered in any way a position of power, I think most people are, are going to do what it is to get there. And if you don't have to do anything, it's easy. Yeah. I mean, I don't think you had to do much to be, like, a good Nazi. Yeah, I, I think that it just, 
I think it picked up on currents that were already present in German society and just sort of institutionalized them and reified them. And it um, it didn't I, come out know, of thin air either. That's what I mean, though. Yeah, yeah. like it, like I was reading about um, King Leopold of Belgium a couple of weeks ago, and to me, he seems like he laid the groundwork as much as anybody for Nazi idealism. Tell me about him. Um, he uh, he he was the king of Belgium in the 19th century or the 18th century. I don't remember exactly when. But he uh, he owned, I think, the Congo personally, privately. He owned the Congo, not as uh, he he didn't own it as the head of state of Belgium. He owned it as a private citizen, and he ran like this this brutal campaign against the native people. Um, they would be punished severely, you know, hands and feet cut off of kids for not being able to harvest rubber fast enough or. It's like it th- oh. it, things like this, and it, to to me, like it, it is not. It's not much different what he did in the Congo to to what the Nazis wanted to do in Germany. I can see that there is a level of linearity that leads to the Nazis holding power in Western Europe. Like they're not created in a vacuum. They they didn't just pop up. After Hitler got out of jail, right? Like a lot of- there, there, there was a history that shows you that there is the mindset of of what the Nazis would become that exists in that in that part of the world at that time. It's a shame that um, it's a shame that in the U.S. they don't teach us about the history of Germany really pre World War Two. They teach us about what the government was doing, but they don't teach us about socially what was going on at the time, because I think because it, in order to like whitewash it of any of its like uh, political meaning, you kind of can't talk about like reactions to Nazism, because after all, the reactions to fascists are always going to be like leftist reactions. And when was the when was any time that we ever talked about anything in school that was explicitly stated as being left? You know, no one learned. We don't learn the dis- the, the distinction between you know, Democrats and leftists in school. It's not, it doesn't exist in, in, you know, in in American high schools. I took... We barely know who Karl Marx is. I took, um, my cousin's, uh, poli-sci course in school. It was like poli-sci and government. And we Mm -hmm. didn't, we didn't do that. Mm. Like, again, because like, college, like, everything is propaganda, right? Everything is. There's no. There's no way around it. We talked about this in the, um, the Studio Ghibli episode. Everything is propaganda, and like, t- for me, the the place in my life where I was like most propagandized is definitely high school. The way they the way that they teach you things leaves you open to it. Yeah. Because reality is like, the only people you're talking to are teenagers, and you're always taught that you listen to the adults. And so it, like for me, the, the smart adults, well, I say smart, the adults that I was, I wound up listening to were the Joe Rogans and the Alex Joneses, you know, and thankfully I stopped doing that on my own. Um, but to, for me, like history is one of the, one of the like most dangerous subjects that they teach in school. I mean, there's nothing, there's no harm done in math, you know, or in the physical sciences, at least. I mean, I don't think I learned in, I, I don't think I was propagandized in Miss Smith's anatomy class. Although, you never know. But history is, is a bad class to make, for kids to be taking. Because they teach, they do teach American exceptionalism. And, and most of what we, most of what we're taught is American history. Um, well, we're not taught American history. We're taught colonial history and like parabellum history. But you know, there there's not any nuance to it. We don't talk about you know. I I feel like I remember 
hearing about the explosion of uh, the main that triggered the Spanish-American War, right? But who did anybody ever tell us that we did it? They they talk about it. They always whenever they talk about times with the U.S. allied, they always talk about it in the same way, which is like, yeah, there was some stuff in the news that was like, or it was like the U.S. Acu- government accused the Spanish of of doing this, and they thought that that was the case or whatever. And then late, and then like at the end of the paragraph or in the next paragraph, it's always like, oh yeah, but like it might have been, if they even admit to it at all, it's like, oh yeah, but they it, like it was later believed that they might have like made it up or something like that. It's always a side note, or your teacher tells it to you if they're a good teacher. But the, 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 the way that the history books organize things is that the main sort of continuous linear story always takes for granted sort of the, uh, the, the best possible light for, for America and for who was writing the book. And then um, if they give you anything at all, if, maybe if it's necessary to make the rest of the story coherent, it's always sort of like a... a, a, a uh, like a li- like a little detour you can take. You don't have to if you're not listening very closely, you're going to miss it. Yeah, and I I'm just thinking now about like how well it suits the propaganda machine that is American education that it was not Mr. Gosick that taught American history. You know, they they, they couldn't let the hippie teacher that roller skated through the halls between classes. Like they couldn't let him teach American history. It had to be yeah. it had to be Mr. Bacallus who was like an all-American Even, guy. Yeah. Right, who's a conservative. I mean, he's like a human oh, yeah. hamburger. He, Yeah, he definitely is a human hamburger. That's so yeah. true. Mr. Gozik is like a, like a, I don't know what he is. If, if you're going to keep with that metaphor. Well, right? like, what I, all I mean is that like he is like this, the prototypical American to me, Mr. Bacallus is. Yeah, yeah. Like pick pick yeah, any exactly, pick any yeah. American symbol, and he is like a human version of that. <laughs> right, he's like a he's like an eagle clutching a hammer, like a Big Mac. <laughs> and it just um, it just it just like. But it's a nice Big Mac. Just in hindsight, it makes so much sense to me that Mr. Gozik did not teach American history. Uh, Mr. Gozik talked about Marx, but he never really talked. He never like one thing that I wish I had heard from Mr. Gozik. Well, that's because he was talking to us in like eight. What was it? Eighth grade. Ninth grade. It was it was tenth grade, I believe. I think he maybe had it okay. went down and taught other other years at different points. But as far as I know, he was teaching tenth grade. He. Well, we were in the same grade, so that wouldn't happen to he, me. Mr. Gozik, right? Uh, Mr. Gozik told us about told us about how. Well, yeah, he, he had to because he was the global history like teacher. Who, he told us about yeah. Right. Well, he told us about communism, but he didn't tell us about like who Karl Marx really was. He didn't tell us that like Karl Marx was taught in all universities, sort of in economics classes, up until I don't know when. Maybe the, well, the McCarthyism, the, the Cold War, uh, the early Cold War. Yeah. yeah. Right. The fact, like a lot of Marx's ideas, the ideas that weren't explicitly politically charged, were divorced from Marx and you know only cited in in the mouths of other people. Like for example, just his ideas about. Um, about what capital is and about um, – uh, what's the word I'm, I'm trying to think of right now? I don't know. Uh, I'm, commodities. The, the, okay. Just like the modern idea of a commodity is like Marx and like pe- it's – I didn't know that until very recently. You know, you know what I mean? Like so much, of, so much modern economic theory is built on Marx. I don't, I, I don't know anything. I don't know anything about uh, the work of Karl Marx. I mean – Right, and who can vault you? Well, I can. But aside from that, like, I don't know. Right, the but com- like, like... the Communist yeah. Manifesto, right? <laughs> Think about the Communist Manifesto. I mean, that's the name that he, yeah. ga- he gave to that, right? Yeah. But in... in, in he and Engels and the group that Sure, were... but in 2020, a manifesto is not a good thing. Like, when you hear the, man- when you hear the word manifesto, you're thinking of, like, Brevik or... Like the guy that shoots. It's so funny okay. you say that. Hit, why? Because to yesterday, I was listening to an uh, a very long NPR interview with a guy who um, was an FBI interrogator at like um, Guantanamo, uh, who talked to a lot of people involved in nine eleven, a lot of Al Qaeda people and others. Um, but the point is, I heard on NPR somebody mention that. Um, White supremacists who are committing these acts of violence and shootings and stuff around the world have manifestos. 
And the way he said it implied that manifesto to me felt like, oh my God, like in a year, is the word manifesto going to be ruined by like the liberal media just as like a, a synonymous with r like rambling tracts by right wing uh, ext like extremists who are, who are killing massive amounts of people. And that was a little discouraging to me because using a word that is so neutral to mean something to, and, and just carelessly without any regard for history, making it, it into is something. Like, it is a word that has been made sinister. I mean, nobody, nobody's going to call it like a diary. Right. But it is. Like, it kind of is just a right. diary. Not the, not the communist man. I don't mean that the communist right. manifesto, and, and that's not but what... like, right, you know, right. the, the notes that whoever, Ted Kaczynski leaves behind, it's just a, it's just essentially a diary. Do you think it's intentional? Do you think, do you think that this like corruption of the word manifesto is intentional? That's what that was something that was floating around in my head too. It's like I don't think that it's necessarily intentional because I can think of a way in which it can happen without being intentional, and that is that the media is always going to be invested in selling certain things, and you can listen to NPR. Who are some of the people that are that are that are being supported that are supporting NPR? It's like massive companies, and so NPR indirectly has an interest in distancing right wingers from. Um, like extremists from from sort of the Republican Party, uh, even though NPR is seen as like slightly left of center, their 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 economic interests are are tied up in just they have a lot of large donors like Amazon and Facebook. So what I'm saying here is even even what I'm saying is that they, their in, their incentive really is to use words that are grabbing and that will. That will like people will remember, and that will will, will incite like it sort of will instill an emotion in people. And I don't think that I don't think that it, it doesn't it has to be any deeper than that. That the idea of a manifesto sounds oh it's a charged piece of writing. That's a very shallow understanding of what a manifesto is. Um, you know, you the Communist Manifesto is a manifesto, but it's not a diary. You That's know, what if, I. It's if, exactly if, what, if what I'm saying. What these shooters yeah. are doing is right. Yeah, if the, what these people are doing is, and that. But I also wanted to represent. I also wanted to entertain. Like, what if it is intentional, and in what way would it be intentional, to say that, that that it you know that that the NPR w or whatever, just not to use only them, whatever like media organization. Media organizations will use a word, and then other media organizations will pick up on that word. And repeat well, exactly. It. Like it's right, like like, between, Sin like maybe the BBC. It, well, yeah. it's like it, like Sinclair. Like nobody trusts Sinclair. That thinks about what they're getting in their news, right? Because in just yeah. in the same way that people will call NPR the propaganda arm of the deep state or whatever people say about it, because it gets like two percent of its funding from the government. Like Sinclair is like the propaganda arm of something. Like I don't know what. I don't know what it is. I don't know. Right. Like I couldn't. I couldn't define right. what it is. But like. What if it like if it was This is such a good the, point. The way that it could be intentional is that like if Sinclair is told to do it and Sinclair like runs all the news. Like it practically any news that you see is Sinclair. Like local news, Fox News. You're right. You're right. There's two ways that something like Sinclair can be made intentional. One of them is that the interests that are running Sinclair, like the companies that are giving to Sinclair take ownership of it or are consolidated and, you know, and directly are saying you need to say this and this and this and in, instead of responding with mon like you know with threats of withholding and like money and stuff like that you know so that's one way and the other way is that Sinclair literally becomes hegemonic to the point that it controls all of our news completely at that point yeah, also, but even if, even if it, it doesn't do it no directly longer, the idea the distinction no even if it knows. doesn't do it directly like if if the overwhelming majority of news uses the word manifesto in a negative context, then the other news is going to pick up on it because those people watched that news, like when they were growing up or whatever, when they were being trained in school or whatever. And that's, that's, like, that's how this stuff happens is um, uh, <laughs> biomagnification, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, yes, it's a really good point. A lot of the time, this stuff is not intentional. Um, people get bogged down in 
and like, well, let's look at like, did they are, are, are do they mean to say this thing? Like, is does Congress do people in Congress get together and say like, we're gonna do things that hurt people's ability to live. We're gonna make policies that cause wildfires that destroy towns. We're going to allow development in forests that should be allowed to be to naturally burn every year, and then create rules that prevent those forests from being like you know create create propaganda smokey the bear to prevent those forests from uh being allowed to burn because now there's people that live there that like living there um it's not like people in congress are like trying to like cause people to 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 die in fires but what happens is the interest that they do have creates conditions where people die in fires and the incentive to stop I, I people. I don't know. From, I'm not convinced. The incentives for not for stopping people from dying in fires are too great, or, or sorry, are too are, are 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 nothing compared to the incentives for allowing that to continue. Is what I'm saying. Yeah. What, what, why are you not convinced? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I'm not entirely con- I'm not convinced that there isn't like a a cabal, a sinister cabal of people in the government. Like, there's no way that there's no way. I I don't believe for a second that Mitch McConnell. Is just no like I'm gonna do this because it benefits. It, yes, like I get money McConnell from. It. There's evil, no way. Sure. Like, I mean, there, yeah, I'm saying I like I think there's a sinister cabal. Matt Gates is the same way to me. I think the same about Matt I Gates that, that I think about Mitch McConnell. Um, he is a drunk driver <laughs> that got uh, elected to uh, Congress in Florida. Um. Or, like, Jim Jordan. Jim Jordan is another, like, evil person that is a representative mm-hmm. in the U.S. government. Right? Like, to, like I think there is, like, genuinely, truly, some sinister cabal. It's the only way I know how to say it. In, in the government that is, like, genuinely oh. evil. Like, think about Rand Paul. Like, is, is there a possibility that Rand Paul is just a good guy? Just... Just downtrodden, like. No, I think that the is there point any is way? That a lot of these people just wanted power, and um, and they figured out that they can get away with a lot, and still. They can do nothing to stop horrible things from happening, and then they'll get rewarded from it, and then they'll put two and two together and be like, "I just got rewarded for not doing anything in this situation," um, and then they just do whatever they want, um, or the, you know, not whatever they want. They'll start actively doing horrible things. Um, and, or just again looking the other way, looking the other way, looking the other way. I mean, Rand Rand Paul just like a couple months ago blocked an anti lynching bill. I mean, I know that they like to bloat their legislation and everything, and like put in some, you know, provision that says like this anti lynching bill will also like increase your electricity cost by double or whatever. I know they do that, like. Uh, for me, there's no good excuse that he can make. And it was because, well, lynching is already a crime, so why do we need to make a bill against it? He's pretending that the bill is wasting government time, where in reality, they did all the work to get the bill passed, and then he blocked it to waste the government time. Like, he made it a waste of time. Right, and then he puts himself in this... So he's also simultaneously putting himself in in the role of, like, sort of uh, somebody who knows best and who's, like, wiser than the others that are there. And uh, that really pays off. That becomes hard to argue against once you get old. Yeah, but this is like this is like the double speak thing that that goes back into the nineteen eighty four like Orwellian hellscape that some news media has convinced people that are gullible or people that are like people that are scared of the world they recognize not being the same because I don't know again. I, I don't understand what's scary about it. Like I don't I don't understand not being excited about progress or even even more than not being excited about it, being against it. Like we talk about alt left woke culture as if so like how is in what way is woke culture like a bad thing? I mean there's bad actors, right? There's people that do bad things with it. I mean, Je- Jesse Smollett, for example, is is the person they love to trot out as the example of woke culture gone like going rogue. 
But in reality, he is just, he's just like one a rogue element. He's just in one world person culture. who did something ridiculous and shitty. He he's not symbolic he invalidate of the, the movement. movement. It, like if anything, like you, it'd be easier for me to believe that he was like a right winger than that he is like a symbol of, you know, the actual left. Yeah. Um, this is a good point to sort of pivot towards the meat of what does alt left actually mean um and i wanted to talk about what alt right means again in more detail i want to ask you if does if alt left means anything because to me when i hear alt left right when i hear alt left when i hear left i think center right not center right but like center because everything you hear is like uh, anytime you talk to like smart European people or whatever, they'll say, "Yeah, no, the Democratic Party is like a centrist party over here." Yeah, or equivalent yeah. to, right? So to me, like when I hear when I hear alt left, all I'm hearing is left. Yes. And when I hear left, I'm hearing centrist. Alt right to me is a term that actually carries weight, um, although maybe it doesn't because like, is there is there a non alt right? right now i don't think there is and i think that's a big part like a big part of that is the passivity that you've mentioned um this at this point it's really shows how much of it has is up to the leaders of the party they didn't want to lose power they didn't want to lose face so they all capitulated to donald trump the alt left means nothing liberals view themselves as left and that is tightly controlled by the media and the organizations that fund the media that have vested interests in manipulating the government. Because if it's possible for Americans to realize that liberal just means the type of political system that we have that supports capitalism and doesn't mean radical, um, then they won't realize, or, or rather even that radical d doesn't mean violent, right, necessarily. That radical means wanting to change things so that this marriage of liberalism and capitalism is no longer uh, taken for granted and seen as good. Uh, if like, we can't even get to we can't even get to that, right? Like just because, just because the what am I trying to say? Well, yeah. Let let me like let me say that like one of my favorite things that you'll hear from, you know, the Bernies and the AOCs and yeah. like Rashida Tlaib and every, every like. All the re all the people that I think are responsible and working in the government right now, like Ayanna Presley, all these people, um, what is radical? Like, what are we asking for that is radical, right? Um, healthcare for everybody yeah. is not radical. Like, right. the radical thing is right. to let it be the way that it is right now. Like, to me, there's n that's not even like. Letting it be the way that it is right now isn't even conservative. It is, like, so bloated and wasteful. Like, I don't understand what's conservative about it, right? What is what is radical about really, really ensuring equal treatment under the law? Right? What is, there's nothing radical about it, and there's nothing conservative about see, keeping it the way it is. Like, again, bloated, wasteful. I agree with the spirit of what you're saying. Yes, um, these people, like the people, all the people that you that you mentioned, to me represent the sort of the conscience of liberal democracy, of you know social democrats, people who say if we're going to have this system, we need to reform it. Yeah, that's not really radical. It, they make a great point. The, the, the sort of the 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 the, the continuous r like calling out to people and being like, what is radical about making this system function in a way that allows people to survive. To be honest, what they're doing is what FDR successfully did, which is saving the, the marriage of, of capitalism and liberalism so that it can continue on. Because if it does too much damage, people are going to literally abandon any hope in the system and try to destroy it. The conservative position, right, which, again, I don't think exists in the right. I think it exists in the center which is what people call the left. Like, I think yes. those people are conservatives. They are, like, it, 
to me what like a conser- the, what the conservative value is is saying like let's get the money out of it like we like keep it contr- keep things controllable mm-hmm. right you know to to me like a, the conservative position is to say let's cut the police budget back like way way back Let's not let them have, like, military-grade equipment yeah. and things like this, right? To me, that is, like, what a conservative position would be. That's yes. why I'm saying, like, and th- those things are, like, like, that's, like, saying that the police shouldn't be militarized is, like, a bare minimum requirement for me to not consider you all right, right? Like, there's, there's certain yes, things exactly. that are, like, so crazy that everybody doesn't agree upon. Right, because yes. I, I think that's the, yes, I think the cl- I think the close, like the closest thing we have to what people want the right to be, is the left, like what By is the, left, the predominant what is the predo- the predominant left in the country, like liberal. So people liberals, who call them yeah. who say that they're yeah that they're left wing and they mean that and they mean that they're liberals. Exactly. The people the people that I've the people that I've spent like the last hour calling centrists. A couple things I want to say. One I just want to touch on this the idea of radical. Um I do I think that idea should be preserved and 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 that people on the left should the, radical means addressing things, you know, at the root of the problem. It means saying, okay, what is that's why the idea of systemic, right? Like the plant metaphor lends itself well to that. It's like there's things that are happening that are connected across, that are connected on, on a much larger stale, scale um, than just uh, at, at the level of the individual. Like it's ludicrous to think that things happen in society because of the individual bodies that exist in society. So like talking about radical change is talking about, well, what are the systems as the, like you need a systemic critique in order to talk about radical change. You need to be honest about what's going on in the world or attempt to be, of course, honest about what's going on in the world right now and look at the, who has power and then say, okay, well, okay, so let's uproot this problem. That's a radical approach is to uproot the problem, to say this is the structure that is causing the problem. Let's weed it out. I was going to Google what pragmatism means because I don't exactly know and I was about to use the word. But like to me... The people that get called radicals by Fox News, for example, just an example of a responsible news organization like Fox News, the people that get called radicals are like pragmatists, right? They're they're not like yeah. a- AOC and Bernie are not calling for like a communist utopia where right. Their mo is to save capitalism and stop it from drifting into fascism. Like exactly, absolutely. Like it's it's not radical. It's pragmatic. It's like. I don't even I don't even know when Rupert Murdoch realized that there was something to gain from calling it that. Like but uh, to me I don't think there's a, there's nothing radical about what you know the squad quote unquote you know there's nothing radical about that. There's nothing radical about Bernie's platform. There's no there's there's something there's more that's radical about like Trump essentially like he won the election off saying let's build a wall like what else right. what else did he have like that is ra- right. that it's, is it's radical the, it's the to idea me. of like people use the word radical to talk about about um pushing pushing right and pushing left P- you know reactionary you you can be re- react, radicalized into a left radical, but you can also be radicalized into a right reactionary. And I think that there should be a different term, to be honest, for, for the right, um, simply because the right supports whatever roots are already in the ground. The right doesn't want to cut those roots and try again. The right wants to, to, to nurture whatever that plant is already because it has Exactly. Power. They want to condition the um, status quo. Yeah, exactly. They want to condition – they want to make the status quo – more durable, but in a way, sorry, 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 sorry. I think conservatives, like the, the liberal conservatives, want to make the status quo more durable and improve conditions for people to the extent that the system can survive without becoming fascist. But I think that fascists want to exaggerate certain elements already present in the status quo as reactions to any improvements 
the fascist is the one for whom the, the threat of conservative regulation uh, is, is a problem. And therefore, the fascist has to call the liberal a communist. Obama is a communist. You know, Obama did a lot of the same things that Trump did, but he did it with language that was, you know, positive and uh, that left open room for... Uh, uh. The thing is, maintaining things in a way that doesn't increase pain for people always looks... Um, it, with capitalism, you're always trying to regulate things back to the status quo. You're always trying to regulate things back to, you're always trying to correct a drift to the right. With, with a capitalist, liberal economy and political, economic, social system, you're always course correcting from right to center. You're, if you have that rudder, you're always steering that rudder back to center. And if you don't, if you fall asleep, that rudder's going to the right. It's never going to drift to the left by accident, ever. And that's an important thing that I think people don't, don't grasp, that are liberals especially, but people on the right grasp it, and people on the left grasp it. One thing that both have in common. People fucking, li- fucking people like Joe Rogan don't grasp that shit. They don't understand. People who, 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 who allow millions of people in this country to believe the idea that, oh, well, you know, just, just to be in the center is a good place to be. You know, I, I, I don't really have a, a political affiliation. The fuck you. Um, not fuck everybody who believes that, but fuck the people that make it possible. Exactly. To That's like that. such a privileged position to be in. Yeah, Joe Rogan is a fool. Uh, I think um, I think he is like an example of like th- like a, a great example of a mouthpiece. You know, he is w- whether he realizes it or not, and. I don't think he's stupid enough to believe that he doesn't realize it. Like, there's there's no way he doesn't realize what he's doing when he has a Ben Shapiro on, when he has Jordan Peterson mm. or his daughter on. Mm. Um, I mean, I think he had Candace Owens on. Like, what is the point? What what use is having Can- Candace Owens on? Um, right. The thing I think it was the I think it was one of the thought slime videos that said like something to the effect of. Um, the alt right doesn't need to be smart. It doesn't matter if they're smart or not because they're cunning, right? That's yeah. that's that's something I think is true about Joe Rogan as well. Um, it doesn't it doesn't matter if he's smart or stupid. I mean, the thing he does every episode when he has like a person that people call smart on, whether it's like yeah. you know somebody like Neil deGrasse Tyson, who, as far as I'm concerned, might as well be a friggin' alt writer. Um, yeah, he sucks. He's also just a he, shitty ass person. I don't want to listen. I to him. I can't stand what he did to Cosmos. Like he, I'm sure I'm sure he's I'm sure he's a liberal. He's but a like, liberal. The but whole like thing many he liberals, did, he's done the whole thing he, things to people in his personal life, and it's well known, and he's still very well, famous. Well, I I don't I don't know about any of that. I know he took uh I know he took Cosmos and made it like made it a show about like attacking the church or whatever which is not is it's it's a fine thing to do i guess but it's it wasn't the point it wasn't like that show was like humanist right it it was like such a positive thing but like anytime anytime joe rogan will have somebody like that on the show or he'll have a ben shapiro like oh no i'm i'm stupid like I don't know what's, you know, I, I don't have a position. I'm not, I'm not on the left. I'm not on the right, but I'm not a centrist. There's, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Even if it's true, it doesn't matter because he knows what he's doing when he has people like that on. Like he's giving, he's giving Ben Shapiro a platform that's way bigger than Ben Shapiro's platform. He's giving Candace Owens a platform that's way bigger than what Trump can give her. It's... It's like there's people people on both sides are irresponsible, and the thing I'm not going to do is like do both sidesism. Like it's something I refuse to do. It's everybody. It's everybody's favorite tactic, you know, on the left and the right is both sidesism. Um, it's it's saying that there were fine people at at Charlottesville. Like it's it's such an irresponsible thing to do. Like I was just gonna say, leftists are at a huge disadvantage in this because fascism like I said, has a lot more in common with liberal democracy and in the context of capitalism than leftism, radical leftism does. 
And that's because so much of the ideology, because the ideology of liter, liber, like liberalism and capital, it's all about supporting capitalism. And capitalism itself as an economic system incentivizes people like Donald Trump just to even exist. Um, it incentivizes a power structure, it incentivizes uh, powerful people keeping their power. It's, I mean, it's, it's one of the most obvious, you know, one of the simplest things you can say about any system where there's inequality is that there's an incentive to keep your power if you have it. Um, it already has that in common with fascism. So no wonder people who want a, a world that is radically different from either the world of the, of the, of the liberal uh, uh, and the capitalist or the world of the fascist have so much of a disadvantage when it comes to arguing against uh, just against sort of these um these sort of uh these these uh, I, these ways of conveying the situation that act like there's a scale and that the, you know the center is the center and then th that fascism is here and and that's where we get the idea of alt left right the idea that when the center and the right sort of both already are skeptical of the left as being um, uh, in some way broken from from reality. Let me let me let me try to rephrase this. What I really want to get at is the right and the center have more in common with each other than the left does with either. Uh, the only thing the left really has in common with the center is uh, shared values like. Um, perhaps like liberty, like freedom, um, like justice and democracy. Democracy is sort of a contentious idea because there's people who on the left who will sort of not talk about things in terms of democracy, not because they think it's bad for people to have a say, but because the, the, the modern conception of democracy they want to attack. They want to, you know, they say is flawed. The idea of, of individuals as sort of like uh, people who can be represented by a single vote gets back to our whole two plus two equals five thing. Uh -huh. Th like that, that gets called into question, and that's fine. But what I mean is, sort of, many traditional liberal values are the same as leftist values, but leftist values tend to be uh, the, the the means for getting to for achieving them are different. You know what I mean? So whereas people on the right, their their motive is to gain power. It's it's gain power, maintain power, extract power from the ideologies that are already present in the system without uh, ever feeling ever pretending amongst yourselves to be beholden to things like logic um, and, you know, and laughing all the way uh, as you kill people, as you literally kill people in order to consolidate and maintain that power. So what I'm saying is when you hear somebody say something like alt-right, your first thought should be, okay, what's alt about it? And don't be surprised when the answer is fascism. But when you hear somebody say something like alt-left, ask yourself, does it matter what order these terms like appeared in my consciousness? Does it matter that I heard about alt-right before I heard about alt-left? Is it possible that the fact that the idea of alt-left exists in my mind is a symptom of the rise in power of whoever the people that call themselves alt-right are? Is this equivocation? Like, what's suspect about this equivocation? And why then, why is it so much easier to say people on the left, people like, um, you know, that like, like people who call themselves Antifa or, or just any kind of anti-fascists, um, what's, what's suspect about those people being condemned and how does it make it easier to condemn them when you give them the same term or a term that matches and, and counterbalances the term alt-right? What do you think of when you think of alt-right? You think of people who are violent, people who don't play by the same conservative Rules. Well, yeah. one thing I one thing I've been like meaning to fit in somewhere for like fifteen yeah, minutes yeah. now is it, well, no, it's just because you made me like you made me think of it, and I've I've been fun, trying to find an excuse to say it. But like you 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 were you were talking about you know the left and the center being at a disadvantage uh, when compared to the alt right. One of the th like one of the biggest disadvantages I think is that there is an expectation for us to be nice. Right. Whether we expect it of ourselves or whether somebody that you're arguing with expects it of you. Yeah. Um, there's no there's no pretense of, of politeness with with the right, because all they have to say, all they have to say is facts don't care about your feelings. And that's it. it yes. You know, especially especially when you're like talking to their audience. Right. 
because that that gets that gets like that's that's the thing that they have to say that's their line and you know it completely for half the country it completely negates like the need to be nice which is like as far as i'm concerned like politeness is like a core principle of leftist ideology yeah i I don't know if you agree with that yeah yeah, I do like, agree I, with that. Like, I've heard other people say that too. Because and and that's that's like the disadvantage I think is that for for half of the people that can just be like taken away. Like they they can use one sentence to dismiss like a huge part of the ideology and the conversation like kind of ends. Yes. As as far as the audience worth- is concerned. It's worth reading that one that one quote by John Paul Sartre, even though it, people who are seeking. This I don't. I don't remember what it is. No doubt have heard this already. I'm gonna. I'm gonna would pull you, it up. Okay, um, I was gonna say. Would you mind reading it? I am doing. Yeah, I'm doing that. It was in that thought slime. One of the thought slime videos I sent you. Also, a friend of mine showed it to me maybe a year ago, and I re- remembered it from then. It stuck with me. This is from 1944, I believe. Never believe that anti-Semites are completely unaware of the absurdity of their replies. They know that their remarks are frivolous, open to challenge, but they are amusing themselves, for it is their adversary who is obliged to use words responsibly, since he believes in words. The anti-Semites have the right to play. They even like to play with discourse, for by giving ridiculous reasons, they discredit the seriousness of their interlocutors. They delight in acting in bad faith, since they seek not to persuade by sound argument, but to intimidate and disconcert. If you press them too closely, they will abruptly fall silent, loftily indicating by some phrase that the time for argument is past. I hope I didn't read that too yeah, loudly. Yeah, that's, like, that's another one. No, that was great. Um, I accidentally, uh, I was going through my YouTube history uh, to see which, uh, which video that I heard that in. Because now I do yeah. remember it. And it, I accidentally started playing a Fantano video. But um, that's, a, that's another thing. That's another disadvantage is... There is an expectation on, you know, people in the center and leftists to be honest. And there is no expectation of that as far as the alt-right is concerned. No. Like, you don't have no, to no. be honest. You're, you're, allowed, you're allowed to exaggerate. You're allowed to lie. Because, see, that's, that's, another, that's the thing about the f- facts don't care about your feelings thing. Is that they, they, get, they have, like, carte blanche to lie. Yeah. And be like, be evocative, like, you know, a Ben Shapiro or I don't, I don't want to accuse Joe Rogan of this because I don't, I was going to say his name, but I don't, I don't know if he does it. I stopped listening to his podcast like a thousand episodes ago almost. Um, but you know, the, the Ben Shapiro's and the Jordan Petersons, they just, they just uh, get away with lying because once again, like. You, when you have to be polite, that means you don't get to call somebody a liar, right? You don't get to. That's like yeah, one of the, that's like do, one of the though, worst. Well, even if you do, like. Well, like even if said, you do, though, um, the the quote, other people that expect you to be polite are like, you can't do that. Right. You know. Yeah, like, that's you up? they. They just they don't they don't have to be honest, but as soon as somebody that like somebody that I agree with as soon as they're dishonest it's a problem and it is a problem like it totally yeah. is a problem but it needs to be it needs to be a problem for everybody and it just it just isn't there there's this controversy going on right now um not to date the podcast when you're listening to this and scholars 100 years from now are listening to this but well it'll be it'll be useful for scholars actually that's true i suppose that was the wrong demographic to call out but there's the there's this controversy going on right now about Trump saying, "Oh, I don't want to go to the cemetery. Those guys are suckers," you know, or like Vietnam is a stupid war, and even though there was a draft, anybody that won is a sucker, all this stuff. But you know, when I brought it up to my dad tonight, and he's like, "Oh, well, you know, I heard somebody say that he didn't, he didn't say that," and so you can just choose which version you like. You it, get you yeah. you just get to choose because it doesn't matter what the truth is. It matters like what you feel. Like I don't I don't have any I don't have hard evidence that he said it. What I do know is that he said, you know, 
with regards to John McCain, for example, he said, I like people that weren't captured. Like, I know for a fact he said that. So, you know, this is me being like, this is me like being open to dishonesty, I guess. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what he said about. People but people like for, people being primed for, for deep fakes, I think, already in this way. Oh, my God. Um, I, I might have to like, I might have to like stop watching YouTube videos. At a certain point, like with, I'm, I'm, because you can't, you can't, like, you can't completely trust what you see anymore, which is, cr it's crazy that I can even say that, but like, there's some really convincing ones. The ones that get me are, um, there is like some video of uh, people, either people do it more with Star Wars or. I love Star Wars so much that those are the only ones that I see. But there's like a lot of like face replacements in Star Wars like with the uh, with the solo movie which everybody hates for some reason. Like no, nah, we'll replace Alden Ehrenreich with Han Solo's like a Han Solo deep fake. And it's pretty it's pretty convincing. There's wow. like there's ones of Obama. There was the one recently where they they used Joe Biden sleeping even though that was like harry belafonte or whoever that was um i heard him on I bl <laughs> did you really was he asleep no i guess you harry heard him belafonte, so he couldn't yeah. have been but no but i saw they, that video because somebody posted it in a chat that i was randomly added to and, I, and then there was a huge argument and i just stayed out of it but yeah i saw that video. well yeah but it's it, it was one of those things where like well like if i didn't feel the need to go find more information about it I would have thought it was real, and it wouldn't have changed my mind about, like, to be responsible, I need to vote for Joe Biden. It wouldn't have changed my mind about that, but right. I would have believed it if I didn't, if I, if I accepted what I saw, uh, you know, yeah, I, I would know. have believed it. Yeah, I had a moment, and, too, of being like, wow, this is just, this makes sense. Because there's, like, left And that is, like... Because there's also left-wing, like, critiques of, or, like, not really the, the deep critiques, but people roll their eyes at, at Joe Biden for being sleepy on the left too it, despite the fact that like really Donald Trump I think is the main person who's saying that I watched that video and I kind of believed it and then when I realized that it was fake by quickly googling it I was like I should have known that was fake somebody pointed out that like he immediately would have been woken up by an aide if that happened immediately he would have been woken up before he got on camera like right, but exactly. like that's like that's like but and then I but and that that's when I realized that that was a right wing trope that that trope of like Joe Biden being sleepy is the reason that idea is in my mind is because of Twitter and Donald Trump that was the point I wanted to make yeah but um, yeah what I was what I was saying was that like that's what I mean about like you cannot you cannot just like we're at a point now I mean when I was ten years ago I would have never thought twice about not believing what I could see with my eyes. Uh, I would have never, it would it never even have occurred to me, but now like you ha I have to be analytical. I, you're forced to be analytical about what you see because it could, it truly could not be real. Yeah. I mean, if you weren't, if you weren't being analytical, you wouldn't have thought, oh, well, this obviously wouldn't happen. Although yeah, of course it did like actually happen to Harry Belafonte. It right. did actually happen <laughs> to him. So it can happen, but it just, it didn't, it didn't seem right because I was thinking about it. But if you're not thinking about it, it seems right because, oh, Sleepy Joe, that seems right. There's, it's like, it's like a really sad state of affairs and I don't, I don't know whose fault it is. I have to assume it's like, we're still like we're still dealing with like the fallout of the cold war i think which like means that propaganda is like the greatest weapon of war now and i mean i don't think we get out from the shadow of that so there's this idea when you know the the, the thing that alt left does the idea of the alt left does is it makes it really legible the idea of um when when people on the left commit violence, they're oh they're acting like you know the right and and it, it, people are people on the left and the center will say that but they won't offer any critique of right wingers. They'll say like, you know when you when people started 
breaking shit. When people were Antifa started breaking shit, uh, just to protest test the the Milo Yiannopoulos speech at UC Berkeley a few years ago, they they gave up their their right to speak um, down to people on the on the alt right because they they lost their legitimacy. Um, that, that's not the same thing. This I'm I'm really stealing from Thought Slime right now from Matt Thought Slime Matt to paraphrase Thought Slime. Um, there's a difference between criticizing something and recommending an alternative. You know, when you denounce when you denounce a tactic, it, it you know, what what's what's what is there different between what you're saying and what somebody on the right is saying? If all you're saying is they lose their legitimacy by you know, com- committing acts of violence. You're saying the same thing that people on the right are saying, and you're not, you're not helping anything. You're not, you're not pr- promoting any kind of alternative. Fact is, um, Milo Yiannopoulos didn't speak at that rally. I mean, it was a success. Another thing that I that I wanted to also sort of um, say is that if we if we if we treat these things like they're like they're um, like if we treat Antifa like it's a brand, you know that that needs to watch its image in order to be palatable to people. We're kind of missing the point. The point is to stop Nazis. Um, and the idea that Antifa, by existing, is creating more Nazis or giving fuel to Nazis is a Nazi talking point. That's a thing that Nazis say to justify to justify so they can what act they're superior. doing. Yeah. Yes. Don't like. Don't be fooled. Um, if it's if it makes Nazis sound good, Nazis are saying it. Keep that in yeah. mind always. There's um, no. There's nobody that's going to compliment a Nazi that isn't a Nazi, or isn't being duped by Nazis yeah. and on the path towards becoming a Nazi, or becoming passive enough to allow Nazis to take. That's power. true. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. So also stop debating people who are on the right. Um, I, I do agree with thoughts on that as well. Uh, it's and with Sartre on that because you just you're not going to accomplish anything other than allowing them to repeat the things that they repeat over and over. For instance, alt left. For instance, people on the left are committing violence and therefore they're, they're you know they 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 don't have any legitimacy. Nazis will say those things, and if you debate them, it's a chance for them to say those things to people that listen to you speak. Yeah, they have they have nothing to gain by being honest. Yeah. It's like a losing proposition for them. There's no reason to do it. Yeah. So any any idea in society that that makes racism look natural, Nazis are going to hop on that and act like it, it's a it's just a pragmatic uh a, sort of a rote pragmatic uh, service that they're per- performing by repeating that idea. Have you seen American History X? I haven't, but Mr. Bacallus talked about it. Did he really? Yeah. Of course he did. American history teacher. Why wouldn't he? Um I mean, it's not, I don't think it's a very good movie, but it shows like, it shows the radicalization of a normal kid to a Nazi. Mm. And it shows how he does that same thing to his brother by being that way around his brother and by bringing people around who are that way to influence his brother. Like it, it shows, I think, in a really visceral way how nazism spreads in in a community in a household um because like i you know they say that they say that racism is like a a learned behavior and that's totally true it's a learned behavior like you're you're never gonna see it like there's not a single friggin there's not a baby in the world that is a racist it 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 doesn't happen um but there are like there are like babies that are destined to be to be racist or to be nazis you know because there at a certain point you just can't get away from it and i think i think that movie shows it in a really really visceral way um but again i don't think it's a very good movie next thing i wanted to say what is alt about the alt left what is alt about the alt right the alt right that's a term that was designed by people you know the likes of i don't know like people like steve bannon I don't know exactly who came up with it. The idea is that it's a it's a cover for something 
gross that also strategically positions itself uh, among uh, you know the established right wing. You know, it's it's an alt- it's like the, it's it's you know it, it kind of it rings like that you know like that like Coke Zero or Diet Coke or something like that. It's a modifier on a thing that we already know that wants to distinguish itself because of some kind of poorly defined difference. And it's not an accident that it's poorly defined. It's it's because they want to pick up on the most reactionary aspects of the right wing and amplify them. But it's the people who are in that group who are defining themselves as alt something. When those people then say alt left. It's not like people on the left are identifying that way. People on the left don't have a reason to identify that way because they're not co-opting a group of people that have power in the world and trying to make them worse. They're trying to to democratize or, or, or basically to you know to make a to make a more just world. Trying to decrease the centralization of power, trying to dismantle power in general, to be called alt. It's it's this weird play on, it, 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 but it also has the same one of the same effects, which is that it associates people who are on the left, who are really on the left, who are not liberals, with liberals, and allows those groups to be blurred in a way that they historically have been. You know, liberals have been called uh, communists and stuff like that in a disparaging way by people on the right who are working from fear of communism, which is a reactionary fear. Um, so. When people use those words to talk about the alt left as if it's this, this, um, this group that has the same sort of uh, awareness of itself politically within the system, the same uh, level of agency, the same uh, purposes, it's it, it's a controlled and calculated projection. It's a projection that has a lot of use to people on the right. Don't say alt-left. If there's one thing you take away from this podcast, don't fucking say alt-left. It's not real. Don't use it as a way to identify yourself. I mean, if you're on the alt-right, you can keep saying it. Yeah. Do whatever you want if you're listening to this and you're a person on the alt-right. But uh, another thing I would say is don't, don't let yourself think that the alt-right is anything at all besides the mainstream right. Yeah. Like, do not let yourself think that that is, like, the minority opinion no, don't of, let your of think right-wing people. Also, don't let yourself think that they're not fascists. Um, that At least the people who are leading the movement, who are designing it and orchestrating it, are not fascists. Don't think that they are not well on their way to making many, many more people also fascists. Exactly. Like... It is it is the opposite of the sticker on Woody Guthrie's guitar. It is a machine that creates fascist. Exactly. Yeah, I don't know what the opposite of a guitar is, but it's that. No, the opposite of what the sticker says. Uh, the well, sticker I on Woody. I assume that the instrument. Oh, so it's a different guitar, but it has the opposite. Well, the sticker on Woody Guthrie's guitar is says uh, this is this machine kills fascists. No, I, no, I know. Like, I just the alt right is a different, like a zither or something. Yeah. I don't know. It's uh, it's like a a cello, a viola. <laughs> Yeah, what's the it's worst instrument? Piccolo. <laughs> it's the a pi- piccolo. It's a the piccolo, piccolo. Is the worst that instrument? The worst instrument. The worst Dragon Ball Z character. It's a machine that creates fascists. Like, it. If like if you let Fox News do what it wants to do, like, there's nothing you can do about it. No. Like, you have to be pro. Like, you have to be proactive. About not being a fascist. Stop letting stop letting Fox News make you feel good. If if, you, if it does, stop that. Yeah, Nazis like what, are not going to. St- people on Fox News, right wingers, are not going to straight up tell you what their motivations are. They're not going to tell you what they want from you. What they're telling you is designed to make you react to things in a specific way. Just like that meme about pedophiles trying to become part of the LGBT community was designed to make people post Facebook posts using the words pedophile, LGBT disgusted and kill all in the same post it's just about the reaction that's why it's reactionary they have no interest in in making something better for you yeah um it's you know they would they'll come for you too eventually like you if you are not like a sycophant you are you are opposition Right and and stay that way. Like you have to stay that way. It's exactly what we said earlier. Like having having that shield engenders passivity, and you 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 have to you have to not be passive. Even if you're not like, I, I'm not an activist. I 
I almost I almost went to one Black Lives Matter protest, except I so, showed up late. You know, I'm not I'm not an activist, but like, I'm I'm not I'm not a pacifist either. Like, I I actively make sure that I'm I'm not becoming something I don't want to be. Like, if you if you do want if you do want to be a fascist or a sycophant or a Nazi, then there's nothing like I got nothing to say to you. And I hope you don't say anything to anybody else. Like, I mean, you, you shouldn't. If you are that way and you're like, if you're somehow a good person that is also a Nazi, I don't think you can be. But if you are somehow, like, you have a responsibility not to inflict that on people. Also, it's okay. don't criticize Antifa unless you're sure that they are making, unless you're sure that they're somehow making the problem worse. If Antifa goes to, if people who are Antifa go to, go to some kind of Nazi demonstration, um, or if they're at any kind of even slightly left demonstration, they're there for, they know why they're there. I've seen people, I've seen Antifa people harass doxers. I've seen, you know, sometimes they're, yeah, sometimes individual people within Antifa are assholes to you if you ask them why they're there. I saw it happen with my dad once. But their presence is an important presence. And who's going to help, who's going to help you? Who's going to help you if fascists start marching through the streets with police next to them? It's already starting to happen. Who's going to help you? I, don't criticize the only people who are already out there. Well, I, I crit, criticize them if you disagree with them. Sorry, 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 sorry. I, I just contradicted myself. Yeah. Criticize them if you disagree with them. Absolutely but like, do. Think, think about what you're disagreeing with. Like, if, if, I mean, what is, what, what are you disagreeing with when you're disagreeing with Antifa? I mean, you're not disagreeing with violence or you'd be, you'd be saying like, no, that guy, you wouldn't be saying it about Antifa. Antifa is like the giant on the hill that, you know, they, they, somebody, somebody wants, you know, the people to gather their pitchforks and their torches and go up on the hill and like deal with the giant. But, like you have to, you have to understand like where Antifa fits in the political climate in the world today. You know, you have to, you have to know why you disagree with them if you disagree with them. And I think a lot of people that think they disagree with them probably don't because they're not yeah. thinking about it that hard. Yes. Right. And they'll, uh, also, it's unfortunate that people like Tucker Carlson and many in, on, in Fox News and also just a lot of YouTube pundits who are right wing will talk about Antifa like they're fascists in the same way they'll talk about Nazis like they're socialists. It's just confusion in order to obscure history, obscure the very long history of Antifa. Um, exactly. Like, it, if, there's, yeah. if there's one thing that like, comes out of this, like, turn off Fox News. You don't need to see it. It's not like there's nothing you you're gonna gain by like getting that perspective. They have. I mean, they're not even a news organization. They're not even a news organization. There's like, they call it like news entertainment or something. It's it's, it's a network. It's an opinion network. But, I mean, Tucker Carlson isn't he the heir to like, the Swanson, like frozen food fortune or. Tyson or whatever it is. It's one like, of them. It's one of them. He's like he's like the person that he's telling you is the enemy. Like he he is a stand-in for the person that he's going to get on the air and tell you is the enemy. Like you, you turn off Fox News. Turn off turn off all the news. Like get your sources like source your news from like people and not the talking heads on TV. Yeah. Yeah, if the news if it's a news company and it's survived this long it's probably mostly trash. Yeah, I mean, I hate to even, say that, but it's true. Even NPR, like, yeah, I don't, I, I don't, I wouldn't tune into an NPR news show. I'll tune in to listen to like the interesting music that they play. Now, when I listen to NPR, I'm always annoyed, and uh, <laughs> I rarely hear. I really, I really am able to listen to any anything on NPR without, without being some kind of put off. When I was really small, like, I, I mean, probably like eight, nine, ten years old, something like that, 
I, I always used to watch TV to fall asleep, and there were like three shows that I would watch at bedtime. Um, I would watch Glenn Beck, I would watch Cosmos, and I would watch The Joy of Painting. And I realized that there was like, like a serious disconnect between what I was getting out of, like in terms of like how to be as a person relating to people from The Joy of Painting and how to be as a person relating with the world from Cosmos and how to be as a person relating to people and to the world from Glenn Beck. But, um, like, you have to, you have to, like, be wary of cognitive dissonance. Like, if you hear some, like, you're going to hear stuff that you don't believe. Like, you, and you know you don't believe it. And it is, like, a matter of self-preservation. And you know it, not to believe it. And you might believe it anyway. And, like, you have to, you have to be cogniz cognizant of that. If everything that you're, that you're consuming is entertaining to you, um, okay, I just wanted to say that Nazis will never straight up tell you what they want. You won't know until they've consolidated power and are doing horrible things. Even then, you still might not know what they want or what they're doing. You might not know till much later. We should think about that now. Because there aren't Nazis directly in power. There are some Nazis in power, but there aren't out Nazis in power, is what I mean. Um, but then again, the Nazis weren't the Nazis yet when they were in power. The Nazis of today are, you know, can only exist, are only the, the post-Holocaust Nazis. So um, maybe when you, maybe you wonder, are, are, the, are the concentration camps at the border worth it? And also, um, is the same government that put Japanese people in internment camps um, during World War II, which is still in power, is and also which ins, you know allowed for the enslavement of hundreds. Of, well, sorry, sorry, <laughs> I was gonna say hundreds of thousands, and then also no that that also allowed for the enslavement of black people in the country and, and kidnapping of, of black people for hundreds. This of years. still has a, this still has a provision for slavery written into its constitution. Right, and which still allows right, which still allows slavery in prisons. Um, ask yourself if that country. How is that country going to look in the future? How are the, who are the Nazis of, of, of America today? Who, like, how are the, the political bodies going to structure our understanding of history after they've lost power? And is it enough, is it enough to denounce things after they've, they've, they've lost that power and after the idea of them, the historical idea of them has been fully formed and is easily understandable? Or should we be a little bit more proactive? And also ask yourself, you know, when you're thinking about those things, you have to ask, like, does this country really represent what I believe? And if not, what are you going to do about it? Thank you for listening to Depth Perception. You can support us by subscribing to our YouTube channel, kicking us a little bit of scratch on Patreon.